Welcome everyone to the Federal Bar Association, Maryland Chapter, and the Metropolitan Washington Employment Lawyers Association's December webinar, How to Avoid and Resolve Trade Secret Claims Against Employees. I'm Scott Oswald and Wheeler's Bench Bar Committee Chair, and I'll be your moderator for today's, today's program. Before we begin, Ezra Golligly from the Federal Bar Association, Maryland Chapter, has some introductory remarks for us. Ezra? Thank you, Scott. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ezra Golligly. I'm the president of the Maryland chapter for the Federal Bar Association. And I want to begin by thanking the Metropolitan Washington Employment Lawyers Association and Scott Oswald and his team for all their hard work putting this outstanding webinar together. I'm going to be brief. I just want to spend a minute or two uh, telling you about and inviting you to join, if you're not a member, the Maryland chapter of the Federal Bar Association. We have about 300 members, all with active federal practices um, from across the state. And there's a number of things that you get out of joining uh, the, the Maryland uh, FBA, but I'll highlight just a few here. Um, number one, you, there's, we offer networking opportunities with other practitioners and judges. So for example, every year in this May, we'll be putting on a judge's luncheon where um, a couple hundred people, sometimes 300 people come and join. It's a chance to meet the judges, meet your uh, your colleagues, and and have a nice uh, a nice time. We offer insightful continuing legal seminars like the the one you're participating in today. Um, we sponsor fireside uh, chats with federal judges uh, done virtually just to get to know um, the judges on our court and understand their practice preferences. And we offer opportunities to give back to the community. Um, so all of these events are designed to foster a high level of collegiality um, that's so important to, to our bar and, and to the practice. And uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at the chapter's website for more information when you get a chance. That's www.fbamd.org, fbamd.org. Um, and with that, I'll sign off and uh, turn it back to you, Scott. I hope to see everybody at a chapter event sometime soon. Ezra, thank you. Now to our participants in today's roundtable. The Honorable Stephanie Gallagher is a United States District Judge on the United States District Court for the District of Maryland. Before uh, receiving her commission, Judge Gallagher served as a United States Magistrate Judge on the United States District Court for the District of Maryland. David Greenspan is a partner at the law firm of McGuire Woods. David's practice focuses on the litigation of employee mobility disputes. Max Miller is an attorney advisor for competition to the United States Federal Trade Commissioner, uh, Alvaro Bedoya. Before his work at the FTC, Max was an assistant attorney general in the state of Iowa, where he was responsible for enforcing the state's antitrust and consumer protection laws. Max's opinions expressed today are his own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Trade Commission. Kristen Sinisi is the founding partner at the law firm of District Employment Law. Kristen's practice includes defending employees against trade secret claims. I'll take your questions throughout the discussion portion of today's program. Just use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Let's begin with a primer on the subjects that we'll discuss today. Kristen, on the Defense Trade Secrets Act and the FTC's proposed rule to ban some non-competition agreements. Kristen, start us off. Thanks, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, before we get started, please note that we will email a copy of the slide deck to anyone who registered for today's event. Turning now to the Defend Trade Secrets Act, former President Obama signed the act, which enjoyed wide bipartisan support into law in May of 2016. The legislation was modeled after the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, and it was created for two primary purposes. First, there was no federal private cause of action for trade secret misappropriation. So if a trade secrets plaintiff sought to file a suit, they had to do so in state court unless there was diversity jurisdiction or a separate federal claim. Um, the passage of the DTSA provided a mechanism for plaintiffs to sue in federal court directly. 
Second, state trade secret laws vary widely with respect to both the text of the laws and their applications. For example, state laws define trade secrets differently, um, they provide different remedies, and they provide different statutes of limitations. The Defend Trade Secrets Act created a uniform law that applied in federal courts across the country. It also sought to, to provide clearer rules and predictability. While today's focus will be on the act's civil provisions, note that the act does provide for organizational liability and criminal penalties, including fines and imprisonment. Uh, Section 1836 governs civil actions brought under the Defend Trade Secrets Act for misappropriation of a trade secret. To establish a cause of action, a plaintiff must satisfy four elements. First, the plaintiff must own a trade secret. Section 1839, subpart B, defines trade secrets broadly as all forms and types of financial, business, scientific, technical, economic, or engineering information, regardless of the form or how they're stored. Even if information meets this definition, in order for it to qualify as a trade secret under the Act, it still must meet two additional conditions. First, the owner must have taken reasonable measures to keep the information secret. And second, the information must derive independent economic value from not being generally known or readily ascertainable through proper means. It's a mouthful. Um, in other words, the fact that the information is secret and can't be easily discerned in a legal way must give the information economic value. Uh, with respect to the second element, the trade secret must relate to products or services actually used or intended for use in interstate or foreign commerce. Typically, this requirement should be pretty easily satisfied, but courts have dismissed claims brought under the act where the plaintiff fails to plead a nexus between the trade secret and interstate commerce. Some courts have even gone so far as to question on their own motion a trade secret's relationship to interstate commerce. So you'll want to carefully consider the nexus when you're drafting a complaint or evaluating whether to file a motion to dismiss. Third, a plaintiff must establish misappropriation of the trade secret. Misappropriation can occur in a number of ways. It occurs when a trade secret is acquired by improper means, be it theft, bribery, misrepresentation, breach of a duty of confidentiality, inducing someone else to breach a duty of confidentiality, or corporate espionage. Misappropriation also means use or disclosure without consent when the defendant knew or had reason to know that the trade secret came from someone who acquired it by improper means, was acquired under circumstances giving rise to a duty to maintain its secrecy or limit its use, um, came from a person who had a duty to maintain its secrecy or limit its use, or the defendant knew it was a trade secret, even if the defendant acquired it by accident or mistake. Some courts also require plaintiffs to plead that they have suffered damages based on the misappropriation, while others don't require damages to be, to be pled specifically in the complaint. Again, you'll want to make sure you do your homework on this piece when drafting a claim under the DTSA or contemplating filing a motion to dismiss. Under Section 1836B, a trade secrets plaintiff has a wide variety of relief available. Plaintiffs can obtain injunctive relief to prevent misappropriation, to require certain actions to protect a trade secret, and to condition future use of the trade secret on payment of a reasonable royalty. Economic damages can be in the form of actual financial losses and unjust enrichment, though unjust enrichment damages are not duplicative of actual losses. Um, as an alternative to actual losses or unjust enrichment, a plaintiff may receive a reasonable royalty for the defendant's use or disclosure of the trade secret. In extraordinary cases, under Federal Rule of Civil Pro Procedure 65, uh, the court may order the seizure of the trade secret to prevent further use or disclosure of it. Exemplary damages and attorney's fees are available where there has been a willful and malicious misappropriation. Attorney's fees are also available when the claim of misappropriation was brought in bad faith. 
Importantly, attorney's fees are not routinely awarded to the prevailing party. Again, they are available when there's a case of willful and malicious misappropriation or when the claim was brought in bad faith. Importantly, Section 1833B immunizes certain disclosures from civil and criminal liability under the Act. Disclosures are immune when they're made confidentially to a government official or an attorney, and they're made solely for the purpose of reporting or investigating a suspected violation of the law. Disclosures made in complaints, in lawsuit filings, or in other proceedings are also immune, so long as those filings are made under seal. Similarly, a whistleblower who files a retaliation lawsuit against their employer may disclose the employer's trade secrets to their attorney and use them in the lawsuit, so long as the documents containing the trade secret are filed under seal and the employee doesn't otherwise disclose the trade secrets, except as ordered by the court, of course. A few additional considerations to keep in mind when bringing or defending against a claim under the Act. The Act does not preempt trade secret claims brought under state law, so both federal and state trade secret claims may be brought at the same time. However, state trade secret laws may preempt state common law claims, such as breach of fiduciary duty, conversion, unjust enrichment. So in deciding which claims to bring or which claims to seek dismissal of, be clear on the state law preemption issue. Next, employers must inform employees of the Act's immunity provision in any employment agreement regarding the use of trade secrets or confidential information. If an employer fails to provide such notice to an employee, the employer can't recover exemplary damages or attorney's fees in a claim brought against the employee under the Act. Employees and employers also need to consider the implications of regularly sending, receiving, and storing trade secrets information on their personal devices, particularly during this current era of remote work. Um, we'll explore this piece in more detail later though. Historically, employers have used non-compete clauses as one mechanism to help protect their trade secrets and other proprietary information. Uh, however, non-compete clauses have come under increased scrutiny lately, including by federal regulators, because of non-compete clauses' chilling effect on employee speech, the reduction of competition in the workplace, and their impact on employee mobility. In particular, on January 5th of this year, the Federal Trade Commission released a notice of proposed rulemaking to prohibit employers from imposing non-compete clauses on workers. The FTC issued the notice under Section 5 of the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair methods of competition. There's a lot to unpack here with the new rule, but let me hit on a few of the proposed rule's high points. The proposed rule broadly defines a non-compete as a contractual term between an employer and a worker that prevents the worker from seeking or accepting employment with a person or operating a business after the conclusion of the worker's employment with the employer. And with a few narrow exceptions, the proposed rule prohibits employers from entering into or maintaining these non-competes with workers. A worker is broadly defined as a natural person who works, whether paid or unpaid, for an employer. This definition includes independent contractors, externs, interns, volunteers, apprentices, sole proprietors who provide services to customers. Uh, the proposed rules definition of a non-compete generally does not include NDAs or non-solicitation agreements meaning that the rule generally does not prohibit those types of clauses. However, the rule focuses on the function of these clauses and not how they're labeled. So if a contract provision labeled as an NDA or a non-solicitation is so broad that it actually functions as a non-compete, it's likely within the purview of the rule and thus banned by it. The proposed rule would also require employers to rescind existing non-competes and inform workers that they are no longer in effect by the compliance date. 
In terms of current status, the comment period on the proposed rule closed on October 19th, and the FTC has received over 27,000 comments. A vote on the final rule is expected in April of 2024. Kristen, thank you. Max, I'd like to start with you. Of course, after that introduction to the rule, I would imagine so. <laughs> <laughs> so President Biden uh, issued an executive order in July of 2021 that took aim at post-employment restrictive covenants. How did the propriety of non-competition post-employment covenants become a priority for the FTC? So um, first, I just want to, you know, reiterate the caveat that you made in, in introducing me earlier, you know, that every opinion I'm going to give today, you know, or the statements I'm going to make, these are my own opinions. They do not necessarily reflect that of the, anybody at the commission, including my direct boss, who is Commissioner Alvaro Bedoya. He and I agree on a lot of different things, um, but he doesn't bless everything that I say. So um, just want to make that clear. Um, as far as for how this came, I mean, we have to look at what the name of this type of an agreement is. It's called a non-compete agreement. It is it is anti-competitive. It is on its face. You know what the, what companies have engaged in is essentially trying to make it harder uh, for employees to be able to leave their employment. And once they leave their employment, to be able to go to a competitor and perhaps you know provide them with. Um, um, you know, the skill set that they have gained, um, which would help them to compete in the market. So when you tell you about like, how did this come to the attention of regulators? I mean, I think that it's something that should have been an antitrust concern from the very beginning that companies started coming up with this as a way to, you know, restrict uh, the employment opportunities for their employees. Um, but, you know, we had about 40 years of history here where antitrust laws and antitrust enforcement fell out of favor. Um, you know, where there was a changing of the principles underlying antitrust law, uh, making, I think, the courts, uh, you know, have weakened the antitrust laws over that time. Um, so it's, you know, during that time was when these contracts started to become more prevalent. Uh, and I think regulators were much more hesitant uh, in order to go after, you know, certain types of conduct. But um, I would say for my, me personally, um, not just non-competes, but restrictive covenants, you know, for employment, such as non-poach agreements, um, you know, a lot of this has been going on since I first switched over to antitrust in 2017, um, so for many years. But even if you go back before that, you know, DOJ had brought cases against, um, had brought cases against some of the tech companies that they had entered into no-poach agreements, um, you know, where they wouldn't be seeking, um, you know, to hire the employees of of other of other firms um so yeah I'd, I'd say you know this is just on its face you know the fact that it's called a non-compete agreement makes it something that's going to be of concern to antitrust regulators um but this has been coming on for a while particularly and i do want to mention you know as these agreements became more prevalent in society it kind of coincided with the time when um salaries for employees, you know, when actual earnings for employees uh, were remaining stagnant too. Um, so I think a lot of the evidence that as we see of like the employment restrictions and how they they limited the amount of, of money that employees could make, um, you know, over that period of time, uh, regulators started to take interest in this issue and, and think about what we could do uh, in order to to address this problem in our employment, in our labor markets. So let's talk about the uh, public policy priorities underpinning this proposed rule, Max. Uh, you've got some uh, different set of priorities for kind of low wage workers versus other uh, potential groups of workers. When someone asks you about the underlying priorities of the rule, how do you respond? So, as, I mean, priorities, I'm not sure that that that's the way that I would describe it. You know, all of the the rule is is um, you know promulgated under Section Five of the FTC Act, which you know prohibits unfair methods of competition. And recently, the FTC last year, the FTC issued its uh, statement on Section Five enforcement on unfair methods of competition. And so there are two kind of primary ways that that something can fall under the unfair methods of competition. One is, you know, if it's exploitative, uh, you know, if it's a coercive, you know, act on, you know, 
uh, you know, it applies to, to market participants, but in this case, you know, the employer and the employee, if there is, you know, coercion and exploitation that is happening as part of the act, that that could fall under unfair methods of competition. Um, but then there also can be the effects on the market, on the effects on competition. So when you look at the way that the rule was, was you know, proposed, you have justifications for the lower wage employees, in which case that the finding is, is that it has been exploitative and coercive uh, to make employees uh, agree to these non-compete agreements. But when we're talking about high wage earners, right, the the rationale for imposing the rule, even on the high wage, like senior executives, is because of its effect on competition. Um, you know, when you think about like, so, so take a look at a state like California, right? California has had one of the most innovative markets, you know, for technology and things, and they've banned non-competes. I, I think since the 1970s, I mean, it's been decades that California had, you know, no non-compete rules in place. Um, and so we we have found that, you know, when you're talking about senior executives and the role that they play in the market, you know, their ability to move between employment, um, that's very important for having a competitive marketplace uh, that you get, you know, the, the, the same types of skills that those senior executives have uh, going with competitors and making innovation happen in the market. Let's talk about the FTC's, uh, the functionality test of the rule, meaning the clause uh, in a post-employment restrictive covenant, let's say, is functionally equivalent to a non-competition provisions. Are there situations where the FTC's proposed rule might impact the non-solicitation post-employment restrictive covenant? Well, I think the important thing to remember is it's like the label isn't what matters, right? Like if you're essentially trying to get a non-compete agreement in place, but you're going to call it a non-solicitation agreement, or you're going to call it a you know non-disclosure agreement, um, but the function of the contract is to prevent them from being able to seek employment elsewhere. That is what's going to be controlling and whether or not the rule applies. So that's what you know is meant by the functionality test. Is you look at the function of the contract as opposed to the label of it. As far as whether or not there are particular non-solicitation agreements that could come under the rule, I think that's going to be a very fact-specific inquiry. It's going to depend upon the language of the contract and the impact that it has on the ability of the employee to seek employment elsewhere. Uh, Max, uh, are there situations where the FTC's rule might impact a confidentiality or non-disclosure post-employment restrictive covenant? Well, I, I certainly don't think that that's the intention of the rule. And in fact, if you look at some of the justifications for the rule, is that particularly when you're talking about like senior executives, right, you know, or, or the, these high wage earners in it, there's ways to, you know, what we heard even before issuing the rule and of course in the comment period is that, you know, the reason that you have to have these is because of the, the risk, right, the risk of, you know, uh, confidential information being disclosed, you know, outside of the company. Right. Well, you know, I think the, the proper response to that is, well, you do have other tools uh, to be able to minimize that risk. And so I think, you know, as Kristen did an excellent job kind of explaining the federal you know, Trade Secret Act here and, you know, the ability to go after employees who actually do misappropriate information, you know, that's the remedy. That's the tool. Um, so once again, it gets back to the functionality test. If you're using a non-disclosure agreement in order to functionally keep an employee from going to competitors, that's where the rule would potentially apply. Max, are the situations where the FTC's proposed rule might apply to what an employer describes as an independent contractor? <laughs> well, that is an issue that is, there's a lot of discussion that is going on. I think I'm going to decline to answer that one just simply because of the number of potential issues with me talking about it. Let's talk about some of the exemptions uh, to the FTC's proposed rule. I think you heard we talked about trade secrets. Uh, employers can still protect their trade secrets even under the FT FTC's proposed rule. Is that right? Yes, of course. I mean, of course, employees employers can can protect their trade secrets. That's you know, I, I think this was an interesting kind of. Uh, you know, result of us issuing the, the, the proposed rule, 
is that there was all this, you know, kind of rumors in the in the market. And, and I think that the, the private lawyers kind of, you know, said the sky is falling. And a lot of it was this is going to keep us from being able to engage in non-disclosure agreements with our employees. But I, I you know, I think on the face of the, the MPRM, you know, there was no intention to try to, you know, prevent employers and employees agreeing to non-disclosure agreements and that having employers protect their trade secrets. Max, thank you. Let's turn to the status of in-person proceedings, including jury trials at the United States District Court for the District of Maryland. Judge Gallagher, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Most things have returned to normal at the U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland, but the court has imported one thing from the COVID period. Judges are now routinely using a juror questionnaire with those summoned to potential jury service. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Sure, sure. Um, yes, we are mostly back to normal. Um, our, our number of civil jury trials um, in 2022 was actually higher than 2019. So the dip that we saw during the pandemic uh, has ended. And, and I think we're doing some cleanup of trials that maybe we weren't able to get in um, during, during the COVID period. Um, but yes, d so during COVID, we had to use some different procedures than we had used before with respect to jury selection. And one that, that I have found um, helpful and I am keeping and a lot of my colleagues are keeping is use of a questionnaire. So rather than bringing all of the uh, potential jurors into the courtroom and asking questions and having them raise their hand or stand up and make a line and come up to the bench to answer certain um, private questions, we do a written questionnaire in the courtroom, the jurors sit and fill out the questionnaire all together, and then they move into a, a separate room um, and get called into the courtroom one at a time so that we can ask them follow-up questions in a, a private setting, but but without having the rest of the jury there or having the husher on um, up at the bench. Um, and it seems to be much more effective, and it allows us to um, pick the juries more efficiently because once we get to enough jurors to fill the panel and to have the, the appropriate number of strikes, we can stop questioning the individual jurors. So we don't necessarily have to go through questioning the jurors at the end of the list that won't get picked anyway. So we've, we've found it to be efficient and we're sticking with it. The court now routinely is giving the parties to a dispute pending in the District of Maryland, the option of having their cases assigned to a magistrate judge for all matters uh, judge Gallagher, what are the benefits to being assigned to a magistrate judge for the entire case? Um, yes, yeah, so it's it's an option. And then some of the cases are still being automatically assigned to magistrate judges um, and the parties then have the opportunity to opt out. So so people are getting uh, assigned to magistrate judges either voluntarily or involuntarily, but deciding to stick with it. The, the main advantage really is the schedule um, for litigants because the district judges, unfortunately, we have an extremely busy criminal docket in the District of Maryland. And some of the criminal trials that we see are really long and we have, you know, a month or two months long criminal trials, which obviously really hinders the judges, district judges' ability to get through civil cases and to be available to parties if, you know, a discovery dispute comes up at a deposition or something like that and parties want to get the judge on the phone. It's not happening if the judge is in a, a three-month criminal trial. So, um, so being assigned to one of the magistrate judges um, can generally get the case adjudicated much more quickly and gives um, some, some additional um, access, I would say, to to the judges who who have a little bit uh, more flexible of schedules and, and an ability to be available to litigants on, on more of an emergency basis. But I think there are definitely litigants who have recognized uh, the advantage and lawyers who have recognized the advantage of, of using the, the magistrate judges. Let's turn to employment litigation in the District of Maryland. Judge Gallagher, the U.S. District Court sees a fair number of employment disputes filed annually about just give us a sense of the percentage of your civil docket that's made up of employment related matters yes uh it, it's roughly 10 percent of the overall docket um, unfortunately we only break out discrimination cases but that is certainly the bulk of the employment related cases that we see so about 10 percent of the docket is some type of employment discrimination um, cases. The the actual number has gone down a little bit in, in the last year, um, but the, the percentage has remained constant at about 10%. Uh, turning to the enforcement of post-employment restrictive covenants, Judge Gallagher, we've heard from Pax Miller that the FTC has proposed a ban on certain non-compete clause as anti-competitive. 
there's some anecdotal evidence that employers are choosing to enforce non-competition agreements more sparingly. Are you seeing fewer of these types of claims in cases assigned to you? I think it's difficult to say because the number has never been particularly high. You know, we, we do get non-compete cases every once in a while, but it, it has never been a, a major uh, part of our docket. Um, I would say that um, the cases that we do see tend to be the, the higher level employees that Mr. Miller was just uh, talking about, and, and those tend to arise um, in sort of the, the early um TRO preliminary injunction types of, of stages that that that's when they do come across our desk. But I would say any impact of the the recent rulemaking would be difficult to assess simply because the overall number has not been enormous. Mr. Gallagher, thank you. Let's turn to what constitutes a trade secret, David. Given the breadth of what what the statute says is a trade secret, this is the Defend Trade Secrets Act. Patterns, plans, compilations, program device formulas, designs, prototypes, methods, techniques, processes, procedures, programs, or codes. How do you advise employers on where to draw the line on what a definition of a trade secret should be in their organization? Well, first of all, I think employers need to have policies in place so that they can establish secrecy um, as to that element, right? So I don't think you define trade secrets as you go, because the reason the definition, in my opinion, is so broad is because it's not a one size fits all concept that that thing over there is or is not a trade secret. It's contextual and it's fact specific. And so the statute, and quite frankly, whether it's the DTSA or the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, the, the statute has a definition and you look at the data that's at issue. Um, but to me, you, you need to have policies that speak to whatever it is so that you can establish the secrecy element first and foremost. But then you also talk to the client on the front end. OK, what is it? Why are we protecting it? How are we protecting it? And what's the value of what we're protecting? Um, you, know, you need to be able to articulate the value of the document, the data, whatever it is. And when you're having that conversation, quite frankly, you start talking about, wow, are we protecting it the right way? And is there sufficient value for us to be having this conversation in the way we're having it? So for me, uh, having the conversation on the front end gets the client thinking about all those issues up front so that you've developed a record, not for the sake of litigating, but for the sake of actually protecting the thing, um, hopefully, so that the protection is there that you never even have to litigate. What are some of the common measures that you are advising companies to employ to keep their information that they have identified as a trade secret uh, confidential? I uh, have a really good and sophisticated IT department with strategic CIOs. And again, that's way outside of what I do and what I suspect we do uh, for those of us, uh, most of us who are here today. Um, but I think thinking strategically about uh, intellectual capital. And what I mean by that is, you know, when when entities are trying to protect their stuff, um, really understanding what you mean when, you know, when I say stuff, I'm, I'm using that term generically because what is it that we're trying to protect as an organization? It, it's usually not the Coke and Pepsi formula. It's usually more esoteric. I can't tell you how many cases, you know, clients come to me and say, an employee left and they're soliciting customers and clients and they took the customer list when in reality what we're talking about is the you know outlook and calendar from their phone when they didn't have a byob policy and it slides off into some derivation of that fat pattern um but having conversations on the front end about well, what is our byo uh for your own device policy um, how are we asking clients um or, or asking our employees to track their clients and things like that. Again, for me, uh, Scott, you know, having a sophisticated information technology group on the one side and an HR group and having them work with and talk with each other, that's how I'm advising clients to work together. Get the lawyers out of it, other than in that initial conversation. Maybe that's good advice, not just for this, but for a lot of things in the employment context. David, thank you. Just Gallagher. What kind of company prophylactic measures are you looking for when a company asserts that information is, in fact, a trade secret? 
Um, I think the the um, presentation that Kristen gave earlier uh, kind of summed it up. But but basically, the the things that seem to come up are first the steps that that the company has taken to keep information confidential and secret. Um, that that's always a key factor. And then the second is the economic value, the independent economic value of the information. And th those two things um, together tend to uh, create a, a fairly broad or bright line that can be drawn between information that may just sort of be confidential versus information that truly constitutes a trade secret. Kristen, uh, has the Defend Trade Secrets Act changed the calculus for employees who retain information that they've obtained during their employment? That's an interesting question. Um, on the one hand, it makes the stakes much higher for employees who retain information. The act, as we discussed earlier, imposes not only civil liability, but potential criminal liability, which can be really scary for employees who are trying to do the right thing and report violations of the law. On the other hand, as we mentioned, the act immunizes certain disclosures made for the purposes of reporting or investigating legal violations. At least in theory, the immunity provision should make it more likely that whistleblowers will retain and disclose employer information. Um, practically speaking, I've seen this play out a little bit differently. In my practice, I have seen employers weaponize trade secrets claims against employees more frequently lately. And although there is an immunity provision, um, Complaints filed generally are not dismissed on immunity grounds at the pleading stage, meaning that employees still need to go through the discovery process, which can be quite expensive for individuals. Um, and as we discussed earlier, the DTSA doesn't provide attorney's fees to the prevailing party. So generally, employees are not recovering the fees that they've expended on these claims. All of that said, um, because of these additional considerations, in my practice, the DTSA hasn't emboldened employees to retain documents to the extent one might expect. At least in my practice, I tend to be more conservative about advising clients with respect to the documents they should retain. Um, the Act definitely has added more factors to the calculus and given us more considerations to weigh on both sides of the equation. Well, uh, that's a nice segue to uh, kind of common potential trade secret contentions. David, uh, can an employee retain email communications that uh, the employee says constitute alleged evidence of workplace discrimination without fear that the employer might assert a valid trade secret misappropriation claim? Sure, if they're giving it to the government or their lawyer, lawyer solely for the purpose of reporting or I mean, the short answer is I think it's a dangerous proposition to retain something unless the true and sole purpose of your retention is for that purpose and you've got good counsel helping you through that process from day one. Because what often happens is when employers do forensics and you know, once forensics are started, most people are not sophisticated enough to really know what they're doing. Um, and, you know, most employees are retaining things that they shouldn't. Sometimes it's not for the nefarious intent that the employer thinks it is. I'll admit that. And you all know what role I have in this panel. So, um, you know, pick that for what it's worth. But the reality is that I think it's a really risky proposition to retain, retain things as an employee, unless you've got a good lawyer advising you and telling you of the risks and telling you how to do it. Can an employee retain a copy of the employer's employee manual without fear that the employer might assert a valid trade secret misappropriation claim? Um, without legitimate fear, I think an employee, I think a manual to me is not the type of thing that rises to the level of a trade secret or confidential information. So uh, again, Context specific, but no, I'm not. I'm not sure that that's an argument I would want to make in front of Judge Gallagher. Let's put it that way. Judge Gallagher, have you had a company assert that its employee manual was a trade secret? 
I was just thinking about that. And I think I have, um, again, I, you know, as was just said, I think it is very context specific in terms of um, the content of the manual, what might be told to employees when they receive the manual and that kind of thing. But I actually do think I had a case where, where someone asserted a trade secret over a manual and a wide variety of other things. It wasn't just a case about a manual. David, can an employee retain her own performance reviews allegedly showing the employee's good work performance without the fear that an employer might assert a valid trade secret misappropriation claim? God, are you filing a case against a client of mine next week that I don't know about? Or... <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think that an employee is entitled to retain his or her performance evaluations if they're provided to the employee in the normal course of their employment without limitation. However, if an employer puts protocols in place to limit how those communications are made, for example, if an employer in their evaluations as a normal matter, of course, includes confidential information about the business because someone is in R&D or someone is in sales and provides that level of specificity, then I think the answer could be no. But generically speaking, if they don't put those things, again, it's all about policy and practice. So that one, I'll give you, it, it depends. But again, for most employers, they're not doing that. So the answer is probably no. So let's talk about uh, venues for uh, trade secret misappropriation litigation. David, despite the passage of the federal Defend Trade Secrets Act, you prefer to file trade secret misappropriation claims in state court, especially in Virginia Circuit Court. Uh, tell us why. Well, Virginia in particular um, has a very unique summary judgment rule, which is to say it doesn't really exist in Virginia. Um, because you can't actually use deposition testimony uh, in furtherance of summary judgment. So um, whenever I have a client who wants to prosecute a trade secret sit in the courts here in Northern Virginia, um, I tend to advise clients that if you can plead successfully, and, and actually taking a further step back, um, the Supreme Court has, recent, has held in 2013 that you can't attack a restrictive covenant on demur, that's the Malavik case. And recently, Judge Askarati here in Fairfax said you can't attack a restrictive covenant on a plea and bar either. So if you are a plaintiff with a restrictive covenant and you can plead in good faith a restrictive covenant, it is uh, it is a hard thing to attack pretrial. So for those procedural reasons, Scott, I think in Virginia, Northern Virginia in particular, there's a lot of value in being in state court. Got it. So when you do file uh, a Defend Trade Secrets Act or a Trade Secret Act claim, do you append other uh, causes of action to that claim? And if so, what are some of the common causes of action that you'll include? Uh, the answer is yes. And of course, you know, DTSA doesn't preempt Kristen's, preempt Kristen's materials, made that clear. You know, I, I think we all would say if you see a trade secrets claim, you're also very likely going to see breach of contract which is, you know, confidentially, uh, the confidentiality provision, the non-disclosure piece. There's often a non-compete or a non-solicit that goes with it from some older agreement. You will have a tortious interference claim often. Well, sometimes you'll see tortious interference as to uh, the employee with respect to a customer. And sometimes you'll see it against a third party prospective employer with respect to their interference with the employee's agreements. Um, Sometimes you see conversions, sometimes you see CFAA, and, you know, often, well, not often, but occasionally you'll also see somebody make a run at a conspiracy claim, whether statutory or civil. Those are the more common ones. The last one I think of that's in the playbook is defamation. Uh, if you really want to ratchet up the pressure, uh, when people leave, people get angry, and when they get angry, they say things, and if it gets close to that line, that's a powerful claim. How so? Uh, well, defamation claims because of the unique pleading standards and the damages, uh, especially if it's per se defamation, uh, I a couple of years, um, you know, everybody was following it because who was involved, but I was following it because of all the really inter interesting Virginia defamation issues. Um, it's just to me, 
you're litigating about the character and personality of the individuals. And it's one of the very few claims where that is in fact the case and what makes it, it, it really distorts the, the concepts of what's relevant and what's not. I don't know if that's just my perspective or what have you, but uh, in an employment case, it really expands what can come into the story and narrative that gets in front of the jury. Do you generally file a motion for temporary restraining order or a motion for preliminary injunction with your complaint? Uh, it depends. In my experience, a TRO is such a rare form of relief and one that many judges who I've talked to have said, you've got to walk in with the entire story lock, stock, and barrel. So I personally tend to advise clients to file a motion for preliminary or temporary injunction, seek expedited discovery, get a few weeks, and then go in and put on the narrative at that point in time. Judge Gallagher, does the fact that a party pursues a motion for preliminary injunction instead of a TRO send any different signal to you about how serious the moving party is about the necessity of the relief they're seeking? No, not at all. And, and sometimes it does show um, sort of a, a practical recognition of the fact that some discovery might be needed um, before the party can really make a, a good case for injunctive relief. Um, oftentimes, particularly in these um, trade secret uh, confidential information sorts of cases, the, the employer might only have, have some preliminary information about what they believe to have been taken and, and don't really have a, a good handle on, on the facts of the situation. And their case gets a lot stronger or weaker, depending on the situation, but but at least clearer once they they get some facts. So sometimes that that preliminary dis, preliminary discovery is really useful to them if they are going to seek injunctive relief. If an employer does choose to go the motion for temporary restraining order route, how is that handled at the U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland? So um, it depends on, on how it comes in. Um, if it's filed in, in an existing case, you know, with a complaint for, for a new case, it is randomly assigned to a judge in due course, and then that judge would handle the TRO. Um, sometimes the TRO is filed before a, a formal complaint. It, is filed and then it, it gets assigned um, it's first sent to the, the chamber's judge um, because there's no case that's being uh, randomly assigned. So, um, but typically it, it will be handled by the judge that is going to be handling the case going forward. David, uh, let's talk about a, a special kind of employer. Are there any special considerations when you're representing a government contractor against a former employee who's moving from one government contractor to another? Yes, there are, um, and I and I break out the the concerns or the counseling considerations based on the confidential information side of the house and the restrictive covenant side of the house. Um, you know, we, we haven't talked about this conceptually, but you know, I have for many years. I think a lot of people have for many years, and you know, Max, you kind of talked about this. You know non-competes have kind of been shrinking as a conceptual way to limit people's mobility for the past couple of years, maybe even longer. Um, so really the concept is, you know, what, what are we trying to protect? In the government contracts context, I think the movement of confidential information is still a perfectly valid and important thing to protect. And when employees as contractors move from contractor A to contractor B, what can often be a complicating factor that you really have to think through is, you know, sometimes you're dealing with subs and pass throughs and government owned information and all of those issues play into not just the mobility, but the ownership of the information. So that Scott, to me, is a nuance that you got to get your arms around early and in government procurement and government employment mobility. Um, you often have a little bit more time to know that because you know when the contract is ending, so you know when the moment of mobility is going to happen. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your specific question, but that's at least what I think you're asking me, so I'll stop there. Got it. Thank you. So let's talk about, uh, there's been, you mentioned a lot of regulation in this space. Has either the NLRB's regulation or the SEC's regulation in the post-employment non-disclosure or confidentiality agreement space change the calculus for employers on what to include, you know, whether to include, let's say, a broad 
non-disclosure or confidentiality provision in a contract with their their employees? The SEC 21F um, enforcement has changed the language that we recommend in um, in separation agreements and confidentiality agreements because there has been a pattern of enforcement that we can see and language that has been accepted and challenged. The NLRB general counsel memo that came out in May, not so much. And uh, with no disrespect to the general counsel memo, there's just not any, we don't know exactly what's gonna come in a more official capacity. So I think it's harder to predict what's gonna come of that. And so I have not advised clients to change their um, restrictive covenant portfolio specifically because of the NLRB general counsel memo yet. Your adage with employers is aim small and miss small. Tell us what that means. Well, it's actually a line from the movie, The Patriot, so I can't take credit for it. Um, but if you're gonna have a restrictive covenant, don't just try to keep an employee from doing anything. Like, what is it that you actually care about? And then draft the agreement to address what you care about. So if you have somebody in sales and they have a specific market or territory and they're servicing a certain type of client or handful of clients, identify that and that should be the scope of the restraint. If you do that up front, it'll be a lot easier to go into court and try to enforce that because you've shown you you will be able to demonstrate to the court this is why we have this restraint as opposed to you backed into something um if you have an r d employee and you can show that you're trying to restrain uh, the data set because of what the work the person is doing is you show why you build a restraint to a particular person or type of work so you again aim small miss small you build a restrictive covenant for the employer the type of work the employee is doing Let's turn to working with opposing counsel in Trade Secret Act claims. Kristen, when a, an employee comes to you with a raft of documents or other ESI, under what circumstances do you uh, return documents to the employer on the employee's behalf? That's a really good question. Um, I think first it depends, is this an active employee? Are they preparing to leave? Usually they're only coming to me if there's an exit on the horizon. Um, so if they're preparing to leave and they have employer documents, the first thing that I look at is the employment agreement, employer policies, uh, confidentiality agreement, any documents that govern that relationship and could potentially impose any duty for the employer to either destroy the documents or return the documents to the employer. Um, that duty is usually triggered at the end of the employment. So that's a natural point at which to return or destroy the documents. Um, it's a little bit more challenging and by that, I mean a lot more challenging, I think, when the employee has already left the employer and they have a bunch of confidential or trade secret documents that you're now debat debating, how do we handle these? That's a really tricky situation and a lot of factors need to be balanced there. Um, you know, if the employer has not put the employee on notice of a duty to preserve and under the documentation, the employee can destroy, delete, remove access to the documents. I think that's the way to go. Um, if you need to actually return the documents to the employer, that, that can be a tough task because in so fulfilling the employee's legal duty to return the documents, you're also notifying the employer that your client has retained these beyond their exit. Dave, I'm gonna to come to you next, but Kristen, I wanna take our first question from our audience. When documents, what documents can a client provide to their attorneys to demonstrate a discrimination or harassment claim without violating trade secrets laws? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think this plays out differently in theory than under the law. As David had mentioned earlier, there's a lot of risk involved in this process. So under the Defend Trade Secrets Act, for example, um, an employee could theoretically forward from their work email to their personal email and to their attorney documents that evidence the illegal conduct and help support their claim. 
Um, and assuming that they then use those documents only to pursue a claim uh, against their employer, a retaliation claim or some other sort of claim, um, they would be protected and they would be immune from liability under the civil and criminal provisions of the Defend Trade Secrets Act. Uh, that's not usually how these things play out, though. It's it's not usually so neat and clean. I think if you lift the curtain up and think about how things look behind the scenes, when an employee leaves an employer, let's say they go to work for a competing business, they don't have a non-compete or their non-compete's been waived. And as David mentioned earlier, the employer's forensic team gets in there and sees, you know, what the employee has done in their last few days or last few months of employment. And they see, oh, you forwarded all of these documents, perhaps trade secrets, perhaps confidential information to your personal email account. And now you're working for the employer, for the competitor. Um, so you can imagine what they're thinking behind the scenes. And if as counsel for the employee, you have not yet filed with the government or filed in court some sort of retaliation claim, the employer may well be sitting there thinking about what you're doing with those documents. Um, so it, it it's a dangerous position to be in. Uh, David. Yeah, my, my comment when Kristen was talking earlier, and, and again, I, sometimes I'm representing the employee and sometimes I'm representing the employer in these cases. And it's the retention versus the deletion. Because if you look at most employment agreements, there's something in there that says, when I leave, I promise not to retain anything. And at some point after an employee leaves and they realize they have something, there's this, I'm going to get, get, get rid of anything, right? And they, they delete. And the problem is, if forensics are done and an employer can see that you took something and then you delete afterwards, it creates a, a metadata mess where inferences can be drawn against you. So I, I don't know if Kristen, if you agree or disagree with this, but you know, I, I think if you have a client who has stuff before you unilaterally make a decision, sometimes the best practice is to talk to opposing counsel or the employer rather than make a call so that you don't get stuck with whatever decision you made so that you can, you know, retain it, sequester it, and then delete it. So again, that, that was my only comment um, because I've had a lot of cases go sideways just on the effort to try to do the right thing because of that metadata piece. So when counsel, David, for the former employee of your client approaches you and on, on behalf of that employee and offers to return documents to uh, their former employer, how do you respond? Well, first thing we generally do is we ask them to preserve, you know, have the employee preserve everything and sit tight so that we, we can run forensic internally to make sure that we understand what we can see on the inside. And we ask, I will just typically ask, and let, tell, tell us what your client thinks he or she has so that we can have an actual conversation. And once that preservation occurs, then I think that, again, it all depends, getting an image so that you have a a copy of what was taken somewhere and then once you know what that is then you can work towards some sort of deletion so it's it's a two or three step process um that's typically the the way that i think makes most sense now if we're talking about one or two things and it's not a big deal and it's obvious i'm that's not the situation that warrants this but if there's a data dump of sorts then i do think it's worth taking those steps so you don't have a case where you're fighting over these things that you don't need to be fighting about. Kristen, uh, when do you think it's appropriate for an employee to turn over her personal phone or laptop to an employer for forensic imaging? Um, in its entirety, <laughs> never, if possible. <laughs> um, I think there are, you know, I've seen some employment agreements where there is a bring your own device policy at work and an employee is storing employer data on their computer. Um, and I've seen clauses that say at the end of the employee's employment, they will hand over their phone to an IT member of the employer to like check through it and see if there's data on it that then can be removed in their presence. I have less objection to that than I do to the employer trying to take a complete forensic image of the employee's phone just because. Um, I think in litigation, that's typically not ordered. That's not something that is available 
absent extremely compelling circumstances. So I would certainly not advise my client to voluntarily hand it over. Judge Gallagher, if there's a kind of a dispute here, uh, when an employee is threatened with litigation, are there circumstances where it might be a good idea to hire a third party ESI provider to image computers, laptops, phones, things of that nature? That's certainly what I see in a lot of these cases um, that come in, as I said, at the early stages when parties are still trying to figure out exactly what happened. And, and in my experience, it is quite common for the parties to jointly agree on a, a third party or neutral person to sort of collect all the information and, and image it and start looking through it. And, and that seems to be an effective way for everybody to protect their interests and to still move the litigation forward. David, sometimes uh, an employee might have some personal items on their their computer. They've been there a number of years. They've got some photos, wedding photos. Maybe they got their tax returns on there, things of that nature. Uh, when, if ever, is it appropriate for an employee to remove those personal items from something that's the employer's so that they can then maintain it for their personal use thereafter? Most employers would allow an employee to go to their supervisor or HR and identify and, and say exactly what you just said. And then in the presence of IT, pull those things off and take them. I, I think unless it's a really bad exit or departure, if you're open and transparent, that's going to happen. Doing it on your own in the context of a departure that has other things going on in the background, it just creates suspicion that I would suggest is not helpful to the employee who's trying to get the stuff off. So I think a little bit of transparency goes along. Like if I were advising the employee, I'd say a little bit of transparency goes a long way there. David, thank you. Preston, uh, David earlier mentioned one of the cause of action sometimes he brings is a claim under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, in your experience, has the Supreme Court's 2021 decision in Van Buren versus U.S., which defined when an employee exceeds her authorized access on a company's computer system, has it altered uh, employers' use of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act as a litigation tool? In my experience, it has for the better. Um, I haven't really seen many of these claims lately. I think because of the Van Buren decision and the impact it has on analysis under unauthorized access, uh, it's much more difficult for an employer to prove that an employee has violated this provision. Um, as you know, Van Buren relied on a gates up, gates down inquiry and basically said that if you're not hacking into the system or you're not logging in after your access has been revoked, your employment ended, um, then you're not accessing information without access and not violating the statute. So we haven't really... I don't know that I've seen any of these since the Van Buren decision. Let's take another question. Uh, what additional complications are anticipated with the increased use of cloud storage of documents? David? I think we're already there. And again, this goes back to something we've said earlier, policies, policies, and policies. Uh, I think companies are getting better at using the cloud. Um, I think we are talking to clients about their contracts with their vendors is very important because when you outsource, and again, when you have a cloud, that's essentially what you're doing. But when you're outsourcing the relationship between you and your documents and between your employees and your documents, it's really important to make sure that those contracts have everything you need in there uh, when you actually need to go back and, for example, look at audit logs and check and see what's happening and when things are coming in and going out. If you do not have the control of it, you're not able to establish the secrecy. And as we've talked about earlier, that's an important element when we're trying to prove a trade secret. Let's turn to the Defend Trade Secrets Act's immunity provisions. Uh, David, are you seeing more employers providing notice of the DTSA immunity to their employees on the front end at hiring in order to preserve their right to seek exemplary damages and attorney's fees on the back end? Uh, anecdotally, no. Uh, I think more employers are choosing 
not to provide that notice on the front end at the expense of the exemplary damages and fee potential so that I, I think the calculus is rather than say, hey, you can do this, we'd rather forego the exemplaries and fees on the back end. So again, I'd say it's 60, 40, 40, 60, but I think it's more uh, more folks choosing not to provide that notice. Preston, to the extent that your client has a whistleblower claim, either a substantive claim or a retaliation claim, how does your document retention protocol change for your client uh, when that's the case and they might be making a disclosure to law enforcement or a claim for whistleblower retaliation? Yes, uh, good question. I think if they're making a claim, a substantive or a retaliation claim, then their ability under the Defense Trade Secrets Act to retain documentation to support their claim really increases. That's the only circumstance under which they have immunity under the Defend Trade Secrets Act. So if they're not pursuing claims, um, I would not really encourage them to retain much documentation. With respect to when they are pursuing claims and retaining documentation, I still think they need to be very careful and conservative in their analysis. Um, one thing that I like to do, you know, there are a lot of clear examples of what is a trade secret and a lot of clear examples of what's not a trade secret. But I think most of the documents that we have to deal with lie somewhere in the gray area. It's not clear cut black and white. Um, and where there are documents that it's unclear and you want to act out of an abundance of caution to avoid a lawsuit or liability against your client, I, a practice I like to use is preparing an index to set just return everything or return everything you're unclear about to the employer, create an index, a copy of which you'll retain, just the cover page. In the index, identify each document you're returning, the date of it, the sender, the receiver, like a very high level summary of what it's about. Um, not including the trade secret information in the index, and also a description of where the document is stored or can be found on the server. Um, this can be useful for several reasons. First, if you end up litigating the case, you can then request back all of the documents that you previously supplied to the other side. And secondarily, if you are filing a claim with the government, like a SOX claim, or you're filing with the SEC, this is a roadmap to give to the government to say, hey, these are the documents that matter, and this is where you can find them. The, the government's not going to do our clients bidding for us. Um, and I have sensed you know, the, some hesitancy from the government in requesting documents when they think it's a wild goose chase. But if you can give them this roadmap that specifically pinpoints for them these documents and where they're stored, I've found that they're much more willing to uh, make the requests. David, what do you think about that? I think it's a good idea, actually. Um, I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, I, I got nothing other than compliments on that one. Chris, let's take our second question. Notwithstanding the lack of formal preemption of state common law claims, have courts generally provided immunity to whistleblowers by dismissing state common law claims for misappropriation or breach of contract, provided the whistleblowers abided by the restrictions under the DTSA? That's a really interesting question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these issues are not often resolved at the motion to dismiss stage. They're more often resolved at summary judgment or trial. Um, a survey that I did of the case law fairly recently showed most of these issues going to trial, though I suspect some of them were also resolved in out-of-court settlements. It's just, you know, <laughs> to give an example, when an employee forwards to personal email documents that contain trade secrets but are also pertinent to a retaliation claim. And then say your employee, the employee, your client, she goes to work for a competitor um, before filing with the government or before filing a lawsuit against the employer. As David had mentioned earlier, there are going to be some inferences drawn on the employer's side about, well, 
these documents have been sitting in the former employee's inbox for how long? How do we know what they're doing with them? Maybe they actually did access them. Even after you file a complaint with the government, if they remain in the inbox and you're working for a competitor, it's really hard to, it's almost like the employee needs to prove a negative. You have to prove that you didn't use them because you have access to them, um, which really you know, highlights the benefit of getting forensics involved. But for all of those reasons, I, there are a lot of competing factual issues. And I think that most often they have to be ironed out at trial, unfortunately. Another question, does federal immunity under DTSA apply to claims under state statutes? Not necessarily. <laughs> uh, Defend Trade Secrets Immunity applies to claims brought under the DTSA against that particular employee. Let's talk about the mobility of employees where we hear in the news that employees are moving from employer to employer with increasing frequency. How has this phenomenon changed your advice to clients, companies worried about trade secret secretion? I don't think the sky is falling in the way you might think it is when you read Law 360. I see Max smiling off screen here. I'm glad. Um when I first started practicing, I feel like I was told, don't do not do employment mobility and non-competes because they're not going to exist in 20 years. And 20 years later, they still do exist. Different, but they do exist. I think what has changed is I am more successful in getting clients to be proactive about policies and what their agreements look like. And like I said earlier, Let's talk about why you need this restriction for this class of employees or that specific executive. Um, what I think will change going forward is I think we will have restrictive covenants that are smaller, like more, so the number, numerosity, more smaller bites at the apple. So it might be several types of a non solicit in an agreement that apply to. You know, here's a customer specific one and here is an R&D specific one related to a specific thing you're working on so that you're actually getting to the interest as opposed to the functionality of you as a worker. And, and I, I, I hope uh, and having heard Max talk in his individual capacity today, like that's the idea of what is OK versus what is not OK at a high level. Um, but for me, at the end of the day, when you talk to clients, it's the confidential information and trade secrets that you still have the strongest ability to protect. So do that well. And that's where I think if you have counseling conversations, you you have the most bang for buck. So what's changed? Just the access to higher level people because you can scare them more. <laughs> Max, I uh, saw you nodding when David was uh, going through his prescription here. Uh, talk to us. So, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to directly respond to David here. I mean, I do think that at least what he's saying about trying to be very specific and get kind of down more into the nuts and bolts so that the interest of the company is very cl clearly articulated. I do think that that is a, a good movement within the market. But, you know, it's interesting to me that I'm going to get a little philosophical here, legal, legal philosophy. Um, you know, back 50, 60 years ago, an employee joins a company, they stay with them for their whole career. Right. And it's like if the best way to protect trade secrets, the best way to protect confidential information is to treat your employees right. Right. Like to pay them what they're worth um, and to give them the incentive to stay with the company for their whole entire career, as opposed to, you know, treating them as expendable. If you treat an employee as expendable, you know, they're going to want to leave and they're going to take the knowledge that they gained, like in that employment with them. So, I, I mean, I do think just kind of from a philosophical basis for companies being so concerned about their trade secrets, they should be concerned about keeping their employees forever, you know, for their whole entire careers. And the better that, you know, that's and that to me is what's the, the benefits of a competitive market, right? Like when, you know, companies are competing for labor, it creates more of that environment where companies are going to treat their, their employees better. And then I think by extension, protect their trade secrets better um, by, you know, preventing like by by people's choice staying with the company as opposed to using kind of the legal process uh, to restrict people from, from leaving the company. Let's turn back to the FTC's proposed rule 
Kristen mentioned that there are 27,000 plus comments to the proposed rule. Did that did that surprise you personally? No, not at all. Um, because, I mean, so much, much of these are going to be, you know, employees who are complaining about their non-competes. I mean, long before the rule, like I would encounter, I remember when I was at the Iowa Attorney General's office, this was one of the regular complaints from, you know, just employees who were like surprised to find out that they could not go and work. Like they basically would have to leave the state of Iowa in order for them to find employment. Um, so, you know, the, and that's what, you know, I, I mean, I, I obviously understand why companies, you know, are upset about this rule because it means that they're going to have to be, you know, much more targeted in the way that they protect their trade secrets and all that than just doing this blanket non-compete agreement uh, in order to prevent their employees moving. Um, so, yeah, they, you know, when it comes to, you know, how many comments came, I think that just shows how important this topic is to Americans. Um, you know, how labor mobility is something that is important to the people. And, you know, they've been letting their government know for a long time that this is something that should not be in place, that companies have this ability to use their power uh, in order to restrict an employee's movement in the market. Uh, Max, we got a question, uh, if you can answer it. Will the proposed FTC rule apply to franchises? So the proposed rule, Right. And I, you know, I got to be careful here right? because we're, we're in the process right now of reviewing comments. Right. And I cannot, you know, give you any information. You know, we're in the deliberative process right now looking at the comments, you know, and deciding, you know, what a final rule will look like. But if you if you recall, when the, the, the NPRM was issued last January, um, that did not cover franchisees. Got it. Thank you. We are almost ready to turn to final thoughts before I do, though. Uh, I'd like to turn to Judge Gallagher. Judge Gallagher, uh, you served as a law clerk, then as a magistrate judge, and now as a district court judge in the U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland, Baltimore Division. What's changed, if anything, since you first clerked for a federal judge in the same courthouse? Um, a lot has changed and a lot has stayed the same. Um, we obviously have a lot of new people, including a lot of uh, brand new judges who have joined our court, both as magistrate judges and as uh, di new district judges in the last year, year and a half. Um, but I think the, the place itself ha has really stayed the same. This court has always been a, a special place in terms of its um, collegiality and its commitment to really trying to be a public serving institution. You know, obviously a lot of people don't necessarily want to be in courthouses when they find themselves in courthouses, but the court tries as hard as it can to make it a, a user friendly environment and to, to do its job uh, very professionally and with an eye toward public service. So all of that has stayed the same. We are ready for final thoughts. Kristen, start us off. Final thoughts. Um, my final thoughts are that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. <laughs> I think that holds equally true for both employers and employees in this context. But as for lawyers for employees, we need to be really, really thoughtful about the documents that our clients retain when their employment ends, uh, their methods for retaining those documents, and how they use that information moving forward. Thank you. David? Also coming off of mute will agree with Kristen. So I'm going to actually forego half of my final thought because I agree. Uh, being proactive is key here. I would also suggest that it is really important to ask your client why. Why are we doing this? Why are we enforcing this? Why do we think we need to do it this way? Uh, especially with these types of cases because non-competes, restrictive covenants, one of the things I find all the time is there people forget that they're emotional. Other than your family, your employment tends to be the second most personal thing that you have as an individual. And so these cases are emotional to one party and they tend to be emotional to the employer because it's a commentary on the people involved. So I think it's really important to squeeze the emotion out of these cases when you get close to or in litigation. And the way to do that is really be objective and ask those important why questions throughout the process. David, thank you. Max, final thoughts. I really, I really liked uh, David's last thought there. And, and I'm going to build on it just a, just a little bit there as a final thought. 
um, you know, take the emotion out of it, I, you know, I think is, is certainly a good thing from like a legal perspective and, and trying to pursue legal claims. But when you're talking about employment, I do think it is important to remember how personal this is to people. And I think when we're talking about protecting trade secrets, we're talking about protecting confidential information, treat your employees right and they'll do right by you. You know, that's the, I, I think, probably just a, a golden rule, right? You know, treat others as you want to be treated. And I think that as we've moved towards a market where employees are treated as expendable and that companies use their power to more, you know, kind of hurt employees, that certainly creates greater risk of, you know, misappropriation of confidential information. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I would just say treat your employees right, and that will be much better for the company in the long run. Max, thank you. Judge Gallagher. Um, I, I will echo also what, what David just said. Sorry, I have a siren going on in the background at the moment. Um, but uh, these cases do tend to be very fraught with emotion, um, somewhat surprisingly, you know, compared to some of the other types of cases we see. But these non-compete situations are, are often the most um, emotionally charged, among the most emotionally charged that we do see. Um, and as I said at the outset, a lot of times there's not a lot of facts that are known to the parties. And I do think that if the parties can take a deep breath, um, come up, if they're going to pursue it, come up with a, a protocol to find out what actually happened instead of just imagining all kinds of horrors that, that they think happened because they're so um, emotionally distressed about the, the sort of breakup of the employee relationship. Um, but take a deep breath, figure out what actually happened and, and look at it um, very uh, matter of factly. I, I think a lot of these issues can be resolved um, even earlier than they, they often are in these types of cases. Once the facts are known to all sides, um, things things often turn out not to be quite as bad as they might have seemed at the front end. And, and that's why I think a lot of the work in these cases is done at the early injunctive stages. So I encourage everybody on both sides to keep that in mind. Judge Gallagher, thank you. Ezra. Thank you, Scott. Um, I just wanted to say I, I really appreciate the quality of the discussion here, and uh, I just learned so much today. I especially love the, the idea of the index that Kristen and David uh, talked about, but just wanted to thank you all. Thanks to Judge Stephanie Gallagher, David Greenspan, Max Miller for participating in today's program, and a special thanks to Kristen Sinisi, who organized this webinar for us. Thank you, too, to Ezra Golligly and our co-sponsor for today's program, the Federal Bar Association Maryland Chapter. Mark your calendars for the Metropolitan Washington Employment Lawyers Association's next webinar on January 18th, 2024 at 12 o'clock. PG Tips, Navigating the Prince George's County Office of Human Rights and Circuit Court. For all of our programming from the Metropolitan Washington Employment Lawyers Association, you can find us at www.mwila.org. Thanks for joining us today.